online. GoBrave.org, a tune-in radio station, part of the William Patterson Broadcast Network. Broadcasting live from Hobart Hall in Wayne, New Jersey. This is The Innovative. I think they're really unique. The Fearless. They have awesome variety. The Kick-Ass. I love Brave New Radio. The Sensational. I've never heard anything like it. This is the one and only Brave New Radio. The views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of the host and guest and are not necessarily supported by WPSC 88.7 FM, station management, or the station owner, William Patterson University. Anyone wanting to offer differing opinions may do so by calling the show at 973-720-2738. Abusive callers will be rejected. Now here's your program on WP 88.7 FM Brave New Radio. Good morning, good morning, good morning to you. And if you can hear the sound of my voice, that means it's another Saturday morning and this is another edition of The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. As you know, we come to you live each Saturday morning at this hour, 6 o'clock a.m. to 7 o'clock a.m., roughly thereabout. Sometime we run over and that's okay. We bring you what's going on in the world of reading, in the world of books. And then following that is the good news and song, which is the gospel music. So my guest is already on the line. I'm always eased after I get that phone call at 555 because I know my guest is there. I don't have to be sitting there on pins and needle wondering if he or she made it. And certainly my guest has made it this morning and she's calling all the way out of Toronto. That's Canada, folks. The good news is she's still on the East Coast. The bad news is it's still early in the morning. (laughs) So you all who've been listening any amount of time, you know the ritual and routine on Saturday mornings. We open up the show. I'll share the weather with you. I'll read from two books since this is the reading circle we kick off reading and then i'll introduce my guests share some information with you and during that time you get on all your social media sites and let everyone know that my guest is on the air with us that they're to wake up and tune in to gobrave.org or in the northern new jersey area wp 88.7 fm so all right let's go ahead and get that started i can tell you right now as that old song says baby it's cold outside yes it is it is 22.9 degrees in the wayne new jersey area and we're going to work our way up to a high of only 35. And then later on this evening, we're going to drop back to a low of 23, about where we are now. Expected to be partly to mostly cloudy. few passing clouds tonight. And then tomorrow on Sunday, partly cloudy skies during the morning hours. We'll give way to occasional snow showers in the afternoon. That chance of snow is about 50%. Again, the high 35, low of 29. Cloudy and raw on tomorrow night. Snow showers again early. A hundred percent chance. Ooh, I, I guess we're going to get a little bit of snow. One hundred percent precipitation. <laughs> then on Monday, cloudy with light rain in the morning, then becoming partly cloudy, a high of 43, a low of 27, mainly clear on Monday night. Then on Tuesday, partly cloudy, high of 41, low of 26 is going to remain partly cloudy for Tuesday night and Wednesday. Cloudy skies with afternoon snow showers. High of 33, low of 19. Snow showers early Wednesday night. It breaks in the overcast later. Again, the low is going to be 19. That is the weather for the next few days or so. Brought to you right here from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center. All right, let us move right on into our books. You know I read from two books. One is The Power of Being Thankful. The 365 Devotions for Discovering the Strength of Gratitude. So let's see what it says for today, December the 10th. Joyce Meyer says, don't sell yourself short. Self-doubt makes us double-minded. And James 1.8 teaches us that a double-minded man is unstable. He really cannot go forward until he decides to believe in God and trust God's plan for his life. 
I encourage you to take a big step of faith and stop doubting yourself. As the old saying goes, don't sell yourself short. You have more capabilities than you think you do. You are able to do a lot more than you ever did in the past. God will help you if you will put your trust in him and stop doubting yourself. Like everyone else, you will make mistakes, but thankfully, God will allow you to learn from them and will actually work them out for your good if you will decide not to be defeated by them. When doubt begins to torment your mind, start speaking the word of God out of your mouth. You will win the battle. Prayer of thanks. Father, I am so thankful that you can take even my mistakes and turn them into something good. I pray that you will help me put doubt aside and trust you completely. Thank you that in Christ I have everything I need. I never have to doubt again. That's from the book, The Power of Being Thankful, 365 Devotions for Discovering the Strength of Gratitude. From Ian Levan Zant's book, Until Today, for December the 10th, Ian Le says, I will know peace when I allow myself to trust my vulnerabilities. Driving a car places you in a vulnerable position. Even when you are alert to the actions of other drivers, you are vulnerable and you trust that you will make it to your destination safely. When you are vulnerable, you trust that as you stand defenseless, you will be protected. Most people squirm when they hear the word vulnerability. They expect to be harmed when they are vulnerable. These are the same people who go in and out of all kinds of relationships, placing themselves in positions in which can be hurt, abandoned, rejected, or violated in any number of ways. These are people who do not trust themselves and who cannot trust other people. Yet, when you think about it, vulnerability is not something you can avoid. It is our natural condition, and we must learn to trust it. When you allow yourself to be vulnerable, it means that you are standing in the power of your authentic self, which has no defenses and holds on to no pretenses. Your authentic self is the foundation of your power. It allows you to be innocent while being strong. It allows you to be strong while being compassionate. Your authentic self is the part of you that has the courage, strength, and fortitude to survive your fears. Your authentic self is the part of you that knows no matter what happens to you, you will survive. Consequently, your authentic self trusts your vulnerability. It trusts the process of life and it trusts the resiliency of your spirit. Until today, you may have believed that if you were vulnerable, you would be hurt or harmed in some way. Just for today, acknowledge that the presence and power of your authentic self protects you in all of the vulnerable situations you face each day. Today I am devoted to embracing the power and presence of my authentic self. And that's for today, December the 10th, from the book Until Today. And now it's time for me to introduce my guest, who, as I said, is waiting on the line. And I tell you every week in TV, I know they say waiting in the wings, waiting in the lobby, waiting in the back. Well, my guest is waiting on the telephone line. And she's none other than Marnie Grunman. She's the renowned author of Missing, a true story of childhood lost. Marnie has been featured on major radio and television shows such as Breakfast Television, Wise Woman Canada, CJAD, a Lifeology with James Miller, and the National Association of Adult Survivals of Child Abuse. A child who belonged to no one, missing at the tender age of 13. She experienced firsthand the worst of humanity. However, she didn't just make it through. She rose above the darkness, becoming a beacon of light of empowerment for others to do the same. She is living proof that no matter what life hands you, you have within you the spirit to rise, to rewrite the outcome of your story, to create a life filled with love and happiness. What began as a story of healing led to one of triumph of the power of the human spirit of one woman's survival against all odds. Marnie has since become an advocate for the missing, working to change the perception of runaway children so they might finally get the help they need. 
Her compelling articles, engaging talks and interviews, and page-turning memoirs have become a shining light to the loss, the struggling. And Marnie teaches people how not to live their damage, how to heal and overcome, how to rise up and reclaim a life of happiness. A Montreal native, Marnie is the proud mother of three, grandmother of two, and truly grateful for all of the blessings life has given her. Author, blogger, ghostwriter, co-writer, artist, inspirational speaker, a creative entrepreneurial spirit by nature, Marnie co-founded Book Your Story with her daughter Jade Alexandra, a joint venture where they channel their passion for writing into helping others share their stories and ideas. Marnie specializes in ghostwriting, co-writing, true crime novels, personal memoirs, stories of overcoming adversity, health and wellness, and positive inspirational stories. Known for writing with heart, Marnie's style and tone make for a compelling, evocative read from her bold, emotive blog articles, to her thoughtfully written ghost writing projects. Welcome to the Reading Circle microphone all the way from Canada, Marnie Grumman. Marnie, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for rising early to join me. I know we were laughing about it prior to going on the air. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it is early, but no, and you don't sound uh, gravelly or whatever, raspy or how you sound great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I feel a little froggy, but it's okay. <laughs> there you go. As as the hour goes on, you, you know, it, it gets livelier and, and you wake up a little bit more. And before you know it, 7 or 7.15 or 7.30 is here and, <laughs> and, and we're done. But I, I am grateful and I'll, I'm always grateful to all of my guests for getting up this early because my show is a drive time early morning show. And, and many of my guests call from the West Coast. I, I really, I mean, I really, I feel bad enough for us at 6 o'clock in the morning, but for the folks on the West Coast, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning there. <laughs> And, oh my goodness. Uh, so when they appear on the show, they have two options. They either just stay up all night and, and go to bed after the show, or either they go to bed real early and then wake up in time to do the show, one or the other. But they're always there, so I don't complain. All right. I tell you what, folks, you know I'm going to share some information with you, but what I need you to do is get on every last one of your social media sites and let someone know that Marnie Grunman is on the air. We're going to be talking about her work missing and any other work that comes up within you know the next 45 to an hour. So again, get on all of your Pinterest and your Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and on and on and on down the social media list. Let someone know that Marnie Grunman is on the air with me right now and for them to tune in on GoBrave.org and in the northern New Jersey area, WP 88.7 FM. Having a place to go after school will make you a better student. Having an outlet to express yourself will make you a better artist. Having something to do together will make you a better family. At The Y, we're helping build better friends, listeners, writers, swimmers, scientists, and musicians one chance at a time. Give the gift of opportunity. Support The Y at ymca.net. The Y for a better us. Chris, you're not acting like a grown-up in our relationship. M2, M2! There's your comic book collection, the race car bed. I'm young at heart, but I put money into my 401k every paycheck. I'm taking control over my financial life, and that feels pretty grown-up to me. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Are those footy pajamas? This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. You're listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley on Brave New Radio. WP887. We're braver than saying no to your girlfriend. Um, maybe not. But this is still Brave New Radio. Yes, indeed. This is Brave New Radio, WP88.7 FM, and go brave. 
GoBrave.org. We're heard all around the world. That includes Canada on GoBrave.org. So anybody, regardless of where they are in the world, if they have their computer or internet connectivity or some type of smart device that they can get to the internet on with a set of speakers, they can hear us regardless of the time zone. So, okay, Marnie, there here we go. Now, I noticed you've written a book based on your experience. I mean, whenever you were younger or in grade school or grammar school, or elementary school or high school or whatever, was it your intent to one day become an author or based on what you experienced, you just decided I'm going to put it down and write about it? It was really based upon what I experienced. Um, what, what actually ended up happening was I, I started blogging, <laughs> as so many people do. And it was kind of a secret blog, and I shared it with some friends and my girlfriends. And they're like, you really need to submit what you're writing. It's really good. Well, they're my friends are supposed to say that. So I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. And finally, one day, I just decided, well, let me just see what happens. And I did, and, and the article was accepted. And then I did it a few more times. And I realized that people were receiving my voice well. And um, here I am now. I've finished my first book. I'm almost done my second one. So when, whenever you say, because the title of the book is Missing, and I remember I, I just read in your bio around the age of 13. So let's talk a little bit about the story or the experiences that, that drove you to write about. Well, um, I, actually, I, that's what the book cover says, that I started running away at the age of five, believe it or not. Um, and I'm learning that that's not actually so uncommon I came, unfortunately, I've come from a, a very abusive and neglectful background, and um, my way of escaping was to run away from home. And by 13, I had perfected it to the point where that one stuck for about three and a half years. Um, so it's, it's also interesting because at 13, obviously, I'm not a college graduate. I have a little college under my belt. Um, I took my GED to get my high school education, and yet I've still managed to write a book and, and do so, I think, in a pretty articulate way. Um, and that's, that's pretty much my story. I, well, it's not pretty much my story. I mean, it, it, it focuses on the time that I spent on the street, but the, I think the best part of the story is the, the ending and the beginning where you know, I, I put my life back together and I become a very whole person. Well, Bye. more yeah. than more than more often times than not, and I generally share it with the guests and the listening audience probably know what I'm about to say. But if you listen closely to the two devotional readings out of the books, two different books, two different authors, two different time frames, two different races, two different everything. But they're the the reading for the day they are very similar and usually what generally tends to happen is they line up with whatever subject the guest is talking about it's kind of like it's it's phenomenal it really is because whenever i put the show together whenever i schedule guests i don't look in those books to see if the topics are going to line up and they just generally do but both of those this morning pretty much lined up with what we're going to be talking about now you said you started running away at around five, six years old. When you run away, like where would you go? Well, at that age, um, my parents were divorced, and I had one very vivid memory of my father when I was taken to see him when I was just about five years old. So I remember the tall building, <laughs> um, and it didn't look like it was so far away. I could kind of see tall buildings in the distance from my then-grandparents' residence because that's where I was living when I started to run away. Um, so what I would do is I would try to make it to the building. I never did, um, and I would just walk until it started to get a little bit dark out, and I knew that if I didn't get back to my grandparents by dark, I would be in trouble because that was, like, my curfew. So at five years old, I'm wandering the streets by myself, which in this day and age is horrifying. It was still horrifying 45 years ago. Um, and then I would just turn around and come back. Sometimes I would, I would be rather late, but I wasn't running to, like, I wasn't hiding somewhere. I, I actually had a destination at those ages. Well, you, you kind of answered the next question I was going to ask. So you were, you were trying to get to, the, to your father? You were trying to get to the buildings where your father lived or worked? Yes. Okay. Where he worked, yes. 
Okay, so it's all right. That's all right. So, and this is this is very interesting in terms of all the connections because, in terms of, I work in the school system. I work with young children every day, grades two to eight, and uh, and it's an impoverished area, an urban area, and the the home lives of a lot or too many of the children that I serve are really not good. And as I'm listening to you and I read your bio, what always comes to my mind is none of us as human beings ask to come here. And in my mind, the childhood probably is probably ought to be the best times of our lives. Because as a kid, as you know, that's the time when we shouldn't have to have any worries. We're not worrying about paying bills and so forth and so on. And sometimes when that's robbed, it's just very sad for me It's just to hear that and, to, and the fact that I see it every day. Because, again, none of us asked to be here, and then we're put into situations. And where I'm going with this is, having been divorced and remarried, um, I had no idea the impact that it was going to have on my children. None. I had no clue. And I know a lot of the children that I serve are going through either single-parent homes or either divorce or separation or all kinds of other crazy type scenarios. So when I hear you saying, okay, my parents were divorced and, you know, the home was abusive and so forth and so on, it's almost saddening. And then as you say, you get to the end where you say, but, you know, in spite of it all, I still was able to make it. And apparently that's what the book is about. It's, it's kind of like I always call it a redemptive story. Like it starts off in one place and ends up somewhere totally different, like a good news type thing. Yeah, yeah, it will. I mean, it definitely ends up in a, in a very good place. And it, it, when I when I began to write it, I, I didn't have that intention. Um, my intention was really to share my story as a runaway and a homeless youth because when I returned home, and I use the word home pretty loosely here, but when I was returned home, there were no resources for me. And while there's some really great organizations now and there's places that you can go for group therapy where there's other runaways and other homeless youth, and actually in my mid-20s, um, I did do some group counseling and one of the girls there was a, was a former runaway as well, there was nothing that I could go to as a resource and read through and connect to. And there still isn't really. I mean, there, there are a few books out there now. I haven't read them as of yet. I'm only discovering them because of my story. Um, but I wrote it as that was my beginning intention. And what ended up happening, as does with, with art, whether it's uh, visual or, or writing in my case, it took on kind of a life of its own. And I realized so much about myself through the process. And I realized that I'm just a really strong person and, and that I'm also a very ordinary person. And, and I could contribute in the way to let people know who are struggling, that there's really nothing you can't get it get through. If you got through the part where, where you were actually being abused or whatever the trauma was at the time, if you got through that at least physically and you still have, you, you know, your faculties about you, you can get through anything because now you're in a safe space. And so, yeah, that is definitely the most, in my opinion as well, the most important part of my book is not where I've been but where, where I've come to now so that people know they can get there. And at the same token, as you say, that where you've been is the story to help people understand that they can get there. And in terms of now, all right, you started running away around five. And when you first did that, you said you had a destination because you was trying to get to see your dad. Was, was there abuse prior to that in terms of... Um, like as, as your parents were breaking up or divorcing or what have you, or was it just a matter of, I want to go see my dad? Uh, no, my my dad actually, my, the divorce took place when I was around 14 months old. Well, that's when it was finalized. I, I believe he was gone before that, and it was a very bad divorce. Um, I, he also had reason to believe I wasn't his. Uh, there was there was a lot surrounding that. So the abuse was perpetrated by, by my mother, not my father. And when I went to see my father when I was five, I had just, um, healed from two broken arms because my mother dropped me out of a two-story window. Wow. So there was a lot of abuse. There were a lot of things that were going on. And I saw my father as this knight in shining armor right. kind of person, um, who, by the way, I did fortunately later in life get to have a great relationship with. 
Um, and that says a lot considering that the rest of my family and I don't have one except for on my father's side. Right. And uh, there was a lot of abuse. There was neglect, there was abuse, there was emotional abuse, which is the hardest thing, in, in my opinion, having been through all of it because there are no outward scars. So what are you going to say when somebody says, well, why are you running away? What's the matter? You've got nothing to show for it. So that just continues, you know, the abuse and, and the problem. And, you know, I'm glad you, you made the distinction because people hear the word abuse and don't realize there's so many different types of abuse. As a matter of fact, when we first started talking, I thought you were only dealing with verbal abuse. But now as you started sharing even more, it was physical as well. You have verbal abuse, you have physical abuse, you have emotional abuse, you have spiritual abuse. You have, I mean, you have all there's there's various types of abuses. It sounds like you were experiencing a combination of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, neglect as well, um, sexual abuse as well. I mean, I had it all. So, um, unfortunately, that goes on in a, in a lot of households. Yes. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm connecting with so many people, and it's true what they say, everybody has a story. Um, fortunately, not everybody comes from a home like mine, but some people come from a home that's much worse, right? So we have that's to correct. Kind of black things. And do the best that we can, you know. And, and I kind of want to emphasize, too, I mean, I'm a, I'm a product of not just one divorce, I'm a product of many divorces. And I know a lot of families that are out there right now that are struggling, that are going through a divorce or waiting for the holidays to be over, not all your children are going to run away. You know, if you're handling things well and the lines of communication are open and you're otherwise functional and it's just really... A marriage that's fallen apart, don't panic. <laughs> you know, they're not going to run away at 13 and stay gone three and a half years. There are a lot of better reasons. You know, it, 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 children who run away run away from abusive homes. They don't just run away because there's one thing that's going on that's changing their world, right? That's correct. And that's because as we work our way through this, at five, you had a destination. But as you got older, were you still running to a destination or were you just running like, I got to get away from here? I don't care where I wind up, but I got to get away from here. It, it changed to I have to get away from here because we moved from Montreal to Miami. And in Miami, I, I had no destination anymore. And I stopped running for a while. My mother um, was gone for some period. I was living with my grandparents, and she kind of turned up with a new dad. <laughs> um, and uh, he took us to Miami, and, and he was really great, and he was a great buffer. So I would say for about, uh, from the ages of 9 until 12, I ran pretty infrequently because I felt protected and, and cared for. And when I wasn't and he wasn't there, I knew he, he was like my light at the end of the tunnel or the end of the day, right? Um, he passed away when I was 12, and then it took on like gangbusters. And I would run away for the day most of the time to like a field or a friend's house, hide under someone's bed in their closet. You know, sometimes I was really creative and, you know, went to a mall. It just depended. So what was the longest time that you had run away for? Because, I mean, was it just a matter of I ran away for the day, I ran away for, you know, overnight, or or were you gone any extended periods of time? I, I kind of went from zero to 60. So there was one run where I stayed out overnight, and unfortunately I got in a situation with a, a man that, I got in his car. Uh, it's every, you know, it's every normal parent's nightmare. Um, and uh, he kept me throughout the night. And that's actually how I lost my virginity. He assaulted me through the night. He dropped me off at my house. So now he knew where I lived and stalked me for a period of time until the teacher saw him um, watching me on the playground during physical education and asked me if I knew him, and I lied. I said no. And they went over, and uh, one of the male coaches went over and got rid of him. I never saw him again, fortunately. So that was actually the first time I ran away overnight. Um, I didn't learn anything particular from it. I didn't learn, like, hey, I could do this. I learned, like, that was a bad thing. However, I had another trauma that happened in the household, and I ran away, and that time I stayed gone and from 13 to 17. That was it, and I found I, I found that once I made it through the first night, it was like, well, now there's no going back. And 
that that's just what happened, and that's what what's pretty common with runaways. It's not like we pack a bag and put away some money. There's a trauma that happens where there's no thought process. You're just going. It's an escape, and that's it. That's all, and that's what happened with me. And and again, you you went exactly where I was going to go with the next question, and that was going to be when that occurred. As you would run away, what would be going through your mind? And you kind of talked about it, but I mean, what it's like, I mean, wow. I mean, I, I just give me, cause like you, you said in 2016, it certainly, the stakes have gotten even higher, but it's still not much different 25, 30, 45, 50 years ago, because you're still a young child who's out there on her own. You, there's no like really support base for you at that point, other than people you don't know. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, it's really, it, the difference now is, listen, the predators that existed then, they exist now. We know about them now because of social media, um, because there's less of a stigma attached to talking about the things that we've been through, whereas back then nobody talked about anything. You know, all the homes were perfect. Um, but the dangers that were out there were no different then. It's not like they just became invented because, you know, of, of the fact that it's 2016 now, you know, it, it hasn't changed, unfortunately. It's just that we're more aware. And the good thing about us being more aware is that, you know, law enforcement is trying to shut these uh, predators down. Um, but, you know, like we, we all know whether you're in the U.S. or Canada, there's some pretty big problems with the system and the predators that are coming in and out. It's a revolving door. And they're only getting worse when they come out of jail rather than keeping them there the first time around. All right. Yeah, it's a very high percentage of my female guests who've been on the show. As we go through these various interviews, they share with the listening audience how at some point in their life they were sexually molested. And I really didn't have any idea that that to that high of a percentage was going on until after I started. I said, wait a minute. The, and again, I, I cover every genre. It, it just I, I have no limitations on genre. So it's not like I was going out seeking authors who had been molested but more and more as they've told their stories just like you're doing they would share how they were molested either by a family member or a friend or something else. and it began to dawn on me just how prevalent this was i mean the percentage was very high and I, then like, as i said i work with kids every day i know some of the kids in my school are experiencing some of these things of course they're not going to tell it but i could tell by their behavior and then later on the story does come out that they were being abused or what have you the point of what i'm saying is it's like you were saying a couple of minutes ago, nobody talked about it because it like everybody had the perfect little family. It's not true. Um, there's a whole lot that's going on behind these closed doors. And it, I could see why it's particularly in an abuse case where you would run to get away in terms of now, because like we hear about teenage runaways, sometimes we don't hear from them for years. I mean, sometimes we never hear from them again when you get out there. I don't know, because you, you almost now, as I said, because you're out there alone, you've set yourself up for these predators, whether it be the pimps or whether it be whoever who now takes the teenagers and turns them into prostitutes or either, you know, you, you have all kinds of other things that's going on. Did you run into any of that while you were out there kind of like running? Um, I, I did, but I was really fortunate. Um, and, and just to kind of backtrack a little bit, it, it, it's, you know, children like me, we were groomed for them. So they, it's not even a job to them. It's easy pickings. Um, we weren't just groomed for them because we were probably molested in some way as, as children. We were also groomed for them because when you're emotionally abused, you're starved for love. Right. Um, so they have, a, they have a really easy job. And it's one in four females that are um, sexually assaulted some way in their lifetime. And for boys, I believe it's either one in six or one in seven. It's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, astounding number. And, and many of them are repeat victims because, again, they've been groomed for it. When I ran away my first um, week or two, I was sleeping on a park bench, and this woman came up to me, and she started talking to me, and she said, you know, you look like you're hungry, you could use a shower kind of thing. And she took me into her home. Well, her home was a, a little tiny efficiency that was, you know, in the hood. <laughs> and um, I stayed there for a couple of days, and she was, you know, she had nothing to give, yet she gave everything she had. 
you know, and you hear about people like that, and, and it, it definitely restores your faith in humanity, I can tell you. Anyway, um, at night, she would tell me, oh, or at whatever point in the day, listen, you have to go back over here. There was an, a park bench nearby. You watch for the light. When the light is off, you can come back. And I didn't know why that was. Well, day two or day three, she told me that she had a drug problem and that she was a prostitute and that the streets were no place for a girl like me and that I needed to go home. So I lied to her. I promised her I would go home. And the promise that I made to myself was that I would never sell my body. And while I did run into situations where there were people trying to get to do me, to get me to do that, um, and, and generally speaking, the, the, well, the situations I had, it would be a couple. So it would be a, a guy and a girl, and the girl would be the one trying to get me to come along as an escort kind of thing and sell me on the life, right? Right. Um, but I had already promised myself that I wouldn't do that. And because of that moment in time, so early on in my time on the streets, I held that promise. And I was just very fortunate that, I didn't fall into it, but it was all around me. I saw it, and it was tempting. You know, you get hungry after four days right. not having anything to eat. It was tempting, but I just couldn't do it because I made that promise to myself. Well, I'm glad you made that promise to yourself, but at the same time, I understand exactly what you're saying because at some point, and that's where I'm trying to really get the listening audience to, particularly those of you who have teenage daughters or small children or boys for that matter, children, period. That once you get out there into that runaway status, exactly what Marnie was just talking about, you got to think about weather, you got to think about clothing, you got to think about eating, you, all the things that you would normally get in the comfort of home, you no longer have when you're out there running through the streets on your own. And then you're susceptible to any predators. And the predators, as she just noted, if you listened, are not all, for females, is not always males. Sometimes it's another female that's working for a male that's setting you up. And so you yeah, just really, yeah. at that point, you really don't know who to trust. Because I've read many fiction and nonfiction stories, and usually the fiction is based off of nonfiction, of how the girls get out there and they befriend another girl who is a part of the stable, but she doesn't know that. And now this girl brings her into the stable, and before you know it, now she's a part of the stable. And so you really don't even know who to trust, but like Marnie just said, at some point you got to eat. Yeah, I, that's it. It's you know, it's basic necessities, <laughs> and food is definitely one of them. Um, you know, and that's that's what people. It's it's really easy to sit back and judge when you've never lived a life where you're hungry or exactly. Hungry, you know, and um, we need to be sensitized to that, and we also need to realize that children don't need. You said something earlier, and, I, and I'm always trying to drive this point home to people, that children who have a roof over their head, a soft bed to sleep in, a refrigerator, a stove, you know, uh, access to food, television, like, you know, just the normal little things, like look around your house that you take for granted every day because it's just there. A child who leaves that and is willing to sleep on a park bench and go days without food or a proper shower or, you know, just those little things, you really have to ask yourself what was going on in that home that was so bad that that other environment is so much safer to them because that's the truth of it. You know, they're, they're, they, are, they feel safer on the streets. I felt safer outside my home than I did inside my home. I had some sort of weird control over my environment that I wouldn't have had in my home. Yet I still had no control. I just felt I did. That's deep in terms of what you just said and how you put it of what would make you feel or anyone feel that they have something better on the outside than they do on the inside. Now, that is something truly to think about because you are leaving all the creature comforts. But even with the creature comforts, that means it must be awfully bad that I'll take my chances out there without the creature comforts rather than deal with what I'm having to deal with inside the house. 
Um, that is that's deep. For those of in the listening audience, if you've just joined me, I hope you've been with us since six. My guest this morning is Marnie Grundeman, and we're talking about her book, Missing, a true story of a childhood lost. I'm going to share some more information with you, but you know what to do. I just did it. Get on all of your social media sites and let someone know that this is a story they don't want to miss for a lot of reasons. It's a good news story in the end, but they don't want to miss it because you don't want to set yourself up to be in that position. And you don't want to put somebody else in the position to even feel like they want to do what Marnie's describing that she had to do based on her situation. So let somebody know she's on the air with me and we shall return. My name is Diamonds. I am a radio DJ in North Jersey. I broadcast on the frequency of 88.7 FM. I will be on the air every Saturday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. when the sun is setting in the sky. If you are out there, if anyone is out there, I can provide music, I can provide entertainment. If there's anybody out there, anybody, please. Club Melting Pot. Every Saturday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Only on WP 88.7 FM Brave New Radio. Want to expand your horizons? Want to broaden your mind? Well, listen to the only show of its kind. Listen to The Reading Circle. We bring you what's going on in the world of reading, in the world of books. Sometimes the book may be from 20, 30 years ago, because the thing about books, they are timeless, particularly if there's a good message. And then there are times when we do books that are hot off the press that were just released. Listen to The Reading Circle every Saturday morning from 6 a.m. The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. Only on WP 88.7 FM. Brave New Radio. We're braver than taking an 8 a.m. class on a Saturday. We're braver than getting a tattoo of Justin Bieber's face on your face. We're braver than hand gliding in a lightning storm. So tune in to WP 88.7 Brave New Radio. Are you brave enough? I hope all of you are brave enough, and I truly hope you're all tuned in and listening this morning. Marnie, one of the things, because I'm on, I'm on various social media sites, and every time I post who's going to be on the show, I get a whole bunch of likes, and I always say I want to turn those likes into listeners, so I hope all of you folks out there have been retweeting and liking that you're actually tuned in, because again, this is a story that you don't want to miss for a lot of reasons. One of the things I tell Marnie that uh, as one who who taught language arts and who teaches public speaking and all that kind of stuff, I love words. And many of the authors, generally the titles of their books are a play on words. There's usually a double entendre or a double meaning in the, the title. So when I look at your title, Missing, I get a couple of things out of that based on our discussion. First, you were missing as a child in terms of, you know, you're running away, you were missing from the house. But secondly, those were the formative years. Those were the childhood years. And what I'm getting is there's a gap there. There's my childhood was missing. Am I correct with that? Oh, yes. I mean, I never had one. (laughs) You are are correct with that. Um, And obviously, I was physically missing. But the biggest reason um, that I named the book uh, that I included the word missing is because when I started to write the book, people would ask me what I was writing about. And um, I would say a runaway. And then it would turn to, oh, so the runaway was you. And there would be a certain demeanor, um, like a judgment that was attached to the way that people would then sort of click off. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So then I decided to say, well, I'm writing about a missing child, and the missing child was me. And immediately, 
there was a, a shift. There was a compassion. And then when I would say, yes, I was a missing child because I was a runaway, I still had them. They were still engaged and they were still interested and there was no judgment attached to it, which is actually really sad. But it, 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 it showed me that I was on the right path to what I was doing because people really do judge children that run away from home, even, you know, even though I, I'm an adult trying to share the story with them and say that children don't run away from home for no reason or not because they're rebellious, that sort of thing. So that was the, the biggest reason behind the title of the book. Yeah, because for those of you who are going to get the book, it is, which is all of you, I'm sure, if you look at the book cover, you're going to see the word missing is in all caps. It's in large letters, missing, and then the byline is under it, a true story of a childhood loss. Now, what attracted me in terms of the childhood loss piece and why I kind of went into the play on words is, like I said, for me, and, and this is kind of the way I think that for the most part, you get about 18 years, if you want to count those last three or four years in your teenage years, as still being a child, because most kids, whenever they get around 15, 16, they don't want to be considered a child anymore. But for the most part, your childhood is from, you know, in the womb to 18. And once you start hitting legal ages of what you can do in terms of voting or drinking or smoking or what have you, some responsibility kicks in. And I always share with kids that you're going to be an adult a lot, unless God forbid some type of catastrophe happens, you're going to be an adult a whole heck of a lot longer than you were a child. So let's say, for example, if you live to be 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, if you subtract 18 from whatever that final number is, there's a large amount of years <laughs> of being an adult. So for me, back to what I was saying earlier, it's in those early years where really, as a child, you should not have to worry. So the fact that you're saying, you know what, my, I didn't have a child, that is, that is sad. I mean, for, not just for you, but for anyone who tells me that they didn't have a childhood. Because you don't get a chance to get that back. No. Once it's gone, it's gone. And it, that was one of, I think, the hardest things for me to deal with as I was coming into adulthood, you know, I didn't have those milestones of high school graduation and dances and just like the normal, the, the normal stuff. And we mourn that as, as people who didn't have a childhood. It, it's really, really difficult. It, it's such a loss. Um, and it took me a great many years to, to get through that and just to put it to rest because there are no do-overs. You know, and uh, I was lucky. I have I have three children, and I was able to kind of live some of those moments through them. Right. And it definitely filled the gap for me. But it, it was very painful. It was really, really painful not to just have those normal little things. And that's understandably so, because as I said, it's for the most part, you know, each stage is a one shot deal. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like the 20s and 30s, you know, that midlife stage is a one shot deal. The senior citizen stage is a one shot deal. Just like, you know, your childhood is a one shot deal. You really don't get to get any of them back. And I, and like you said, just the normal things of what a kid or a child wants to do. Like you said, just go get some ice cream or just go to the dance or go down to the bowling alley or play outside with your friends in a normal way or whatever. Not to be worrying about, you know, oh my God, when I get in the house, am I going to be abused or am I going to be called all kinds of names or I'm, or I'm going to be living in this tense in, environment. You know, and when I say tense, I'm not even talking about in the house. I'm talking about the tenseness inside of yourself because you never know what's going to happen next. I just, my heart goes out to kids that, that, that are living in that type of life. And the sad part is there's a lot of that going on. It's a lot more prevalent than we probably even know about. I mean, you gave the stat of uh, one in seven or 25% of women being abused, females being abused as children, and so forth and so on. It's probably even higher than that. And probably the same thing goes for a lot of kids who are not having true childhoods. And they have to grow up before their time. I mean, I've had children come to me at the school that, you know, they're maybe seven or eight having to babysit their two and three year old brothers and sisters. I mean, I mean, there might be multiple kids behind them and they're only seven, but they taken on the role of a grown up. <laughs> babysitting too well, having to make sure their their sisters get to school and their brothers get to school and all that kind of stuff. They're like they really don't have a chance to be a child. And that I understandably so I could see where you say that would be difficult or either mourned. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I mean, in the cases where you have young children taking on the responsibility of the household with a single parent who's doing the best they can, that's that's bad enough. That's one thing. You know, in some of those situations, it it can't be helped. Um, But in in the situations where these children are are being mistreated, those situations can be helped. Right. You know, we, we turn a blind eye or... Um, the schools don't have the resources to deal with all of these children. I mean, as a teacher, I'm sure, you know, there's times you want to intervene, but what do you do? You know, where do you send these children? Are they, are they going to be able to go to counseling? Are they going to tell you what's going on so that you're able to report or, or um, you know, recommend, make recommendations based on what they've told you? And children don't want to tell because, first of all, they don't think they're going to be believed. Right. Because that's been ingrained. Right. Um, if they if they do feel they're going to be believed, then they're afraid of what's going to happen to their parents because they still want their parents. Right. Um, even if they're being abused, especially at very young ages, so they don't have an understanding of what's going to happen next. Okay, so let's say I do tell, so I'm going to be taken away from the home. Then what? I'm never going to see my mommy again or my daddy again. We have a we have a huge huge problem here, in that there's a lack of education in these areas between the educators and the children. There's no program available. There's no no um, time in the day where where we're telling our children listen, and they're all our children. If there's something like A, B, and C going on in your household, this is what you can do about it. Here's an anonymous number. I mean, most of these kids have cell phones these days. Right. They may not have much else, right? That's so correct. <laughs> where you can talk to somebody anonymously, you know, where they can get some sort of resource because those numbers are actually out there. Um, we're, we're not doing things enough. We're not getting ahead of the problem. Um, and, and that's a shame. It's a, it's a real shame. Something has to give. Correct. You know, we're, we're continuing to feed sex trafficking rings as long as we turn a blind eye. Because right. these children that run away are the ones, are, are a big portion of the children that are getting taken into these rings. That's correct. And that's where it really begins, things begin to connect. Because you're absolutely right. That's the danger with the runaway. Because as you said, it's an emotional move to begin with. And, and again, I agree with you in terms of the, the, the wanting or the desiring of love. And then you have folks out on the street who's who's pretending to give you that love for their purposes. Um, do you, did you ever run into the situation? Because I'm looking here on your website and I'm looking on the page that says about Marnie Grundman. And I see I'm assuming that's you. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that's you because you're holding your book. Do you ever run into a situation? <laughs> I don't think you have a, I don't think you have a model there doing it but but do you ever run into a situation where someone would look at you and say oh my god I would have never thought that happened to you all the time <laughs> all, all the time and that's kind of the point really you never know you can't you can't judge someone from the outside you know you never know where a person has been. Right. And, and that, that's a big part of the point of me even beginning to write the book, because I came from what people would think would be a good family. You know, when people think of runaways, they think of a child coming from an impoverished home or a trailer or, you know, we have these ideas. But the truth of the matter is, that the majority of the children that run are running from middle to upper class homes. The the numbers don't lie. And, you know, just because the home looks like it's a good home doesn't mean that it is. And we have to pay more attention. So I I like the fact that people thought that they, they don't have that expectation because there's a lesson to be learned there that you really need to, um, take off that the, the glasses, you know, and you, you need to look at things for what they are. Abuse happens in all households. Um, money is not money and education are not indicators as, as, as to whether or not somebody is an abuser at all. When you're talking to folks about being able to to make it through. I mean, what what advice do you, because I see you with the National Association of Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, or do you run in, do you work with, with, teens or children who are in the midst of running away or who have run away what is your thoughts and advice as you're now sharing your story with people to help them understand it's horrendous but you will make it through um 
well, I mean, you know, you can say that till you're blue in the face and, and saying it and having somebody really believe it when they're in just the worst part of their pain um, it isn't the easiest thing other than the fact that I'm standing here and I'm living proof, which is one of the things that I say. Um, but I think it's more about teaching people how to get through it and what they need to do. Right. Therapy for a very long time and still is, and, and some of it is great, some of it isn't, you know, some therapy is good. It's like anything else. You're going to get a good therapist or, or an okay therapist. I don't think there's really bad, bad ones out there. Um, it, there's this rush to tell people, don't look back, don't look at your past, don't look in the past, don't be in the past, don't be in the past. You have to. You have to look back. You have to relive it. You have to make peace with it. You have to mourn it. And if you're able to do that and really focus on, on what pains you, why it pains you, and just mourn it, you know, it's a death. Um, it's a death of a milestone. It's a death of an innocence. It's, it, it's always related to a death of something. If you really allow yourself to mourn it and give yourself permission to take that time and feel sorry for yourself, it's okay. You can let it go, and that's how you get on the other side. And that's what I tell people, you know. And, and, and the other part of it is the shame thing. You know, it's not your shame to carry. It's not your burden to carry. The burden is on the person who's been trying to silence you or right. people who are the perpetrators. And, and those are the two things that I focus on. And see, that's what I meant earlier when I was saying as children, or as humans for that matter, none of us asked to come here. We're, we're created by uh, you know, two people, and we didn't ask to come here. And now once we're here, if we're put in situations um, such as abuse or whatever, and now you try to do something about it in terms of running away or what have you, you're right. That should not be, I mean, the person judged. But a lot of times they are. For many of my guests, as they write stories like this, they find writing to be cathartic, and also, and it could be painful at the same time. As you were now putting all this together, what was that doing for you emotionally? Was it, was it, was it, I mean, I guess it had to be like a roller coaster because now you're reliving what you lived, putting it on paper. But at the same time, you're getting it out. So talk to me a little bit about what that process was like. Um, it was really hard. I mean, there were times, there was one, one, at one point I was like immobilized for four days. I couldn't write. All I could do was cry. Um, and that's where I learned that that's what I needed to do, and I let myself do it. I gave myself permission to, to wallow. Um, and there was another point where uh, I lost 20 pages, and I thought I was going to have to go back and, and rewrite about the first time that I ran away overnight, which is one of the worst sections for me. And fortunately, I didn't. But I wouldn't open the computer for a week because I just couldn't face it. Um, it was very, very, very painful but it was also very cathartic and it was worth every moment of the pain to finally really let it go. I mean, when, when these interviews always fascinate me and I'm always extremely, uh, I always admire you, everyone who comes in who are extremely transparent. I mean, when you start talking about, you know, as a result of this, I lost my virginity. I mean, you, that's, that's about as transparent as you can get. Uh, in terms of sharing with folks. Um, so I'm sure, and this is the beauty of, of books and reading, because this is going to, this is your, this is a way for you to leave a legacy. I mean, you have your, your children and you have your grandchildren, but you have the opportunity to touch so many more people in the world with a book like this. And I'm quite sure you know that. That's why you're doing it. <laughs> but books are around when we're gone. I mean, if, you know, 50, 60 years from now, missing is going to be on some bookshelf somewhere. It's going to be in some trunk in somebody's attic or in the basement or in a library. And somebody's going 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years from now, somebody's going to pick up that book and they're going to read that story, and you're going to have helped somebody in the future. <laughs> I just ordered a book the other day that was written, I guess, in the, must have been in probably the 50s. But it's an old book. that, that It was by Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. Uh, it was called Keep the Faith, Baby. It was an old book that had been around in a library, and you can go online and get it from the various uh, auctions or whatever. But the book is like, you know, a classic for that time that was written you know, it's probably 50, 60, 70 years ago. Adam Clayton Powell has been dead since 72. But I now have a book in my hand that was written by him. And my point being, we're going to be gone, but missing is still going to be around. 
Yeah, which is a, you know, I never really think about it, but you're right, it, it is. And it, it's nice to know that I'm going to be able to help somebody, you know, that somebody will be helped. And I know that I'm helping people now. Exactly. And, you know, it's very rewarding for sure. Now, you write with your daughter also? Because I see like mother, like daughter. Um, yeah, we we actually, um, she does a lot of the editing, and we also are now taking on ghostwriting uh, projects projects as well and we do some blogging together we do some articles together so yeah it's kind of cool you know she was uh, she's always wanted to be a writer she's always written i i kind of fell into it and it's just really nice to be able to work with her like that and that's her in the blue yes so as as that old saying goes you cannot deny her she looks like you nope (laughs) 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 <laughs> Except for the part where she's like almost five ten, but <laughs> it's really funny. Yeah, she towers over me. It's really funny. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it because you're on the left, she's on the right, and yes, your facial yeah. features are very similar. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so like mother, like daughter. So how does in terms of like your your children and your grandchildren when they hear your story or read your story, what are, what are their thoughts or conversation? Um. Well, my two oldest children actually wrote the forward for my book. Okay. And um, it was, it, my son was a big part of the reason that I wrote as well, because I had written an article um, a couple of years ago, and I sent it to him before it got accepted by another, another website, and so I wanted him to read it before he read it out there somewhere. And he wrote me back several things, and one of them was, if you ever do anything for the rest of your life for your children, please keep writing. That's what I want you to do. And um, so when he read the book, because I had him do it also as an editor, he also was a, 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 he taught school. He has a master's degree. He's going for his undergrad right now, his PhD right now. Um, He told me that um, he had always wanted to ask me, about my experiences. My children grew up knowing that I ran away from home and they grew up knowing why. Um, One of the things that is most damaging in the households where there's abuse are the secrets, right? Right. So I didn't want them to grow up in secrecy and I didn't have relationships with my mother's side of my family and they needed to know the truth as to why. Right. But he told me that he was always afraid to ask me, not because he was afraid of me, but because he didn't want to hurt my feelings. And so for him, it gave him the answers that he always thought, um, which only drew us that much closer together. Um, My youngest daughter hasn't read the book, but she knows pretty much everything that's in it because she was with me the longest, just her and I one-on-one. Right. And so she knows the stories firsthand. And um, my oldest daughter, it was was really difficult for her, and she at one point had a relationship with um, my biological mother and now she doesn't so much have a relationship with her anymore because she has insight in a different, you know, she has a different opinion now. And that's up to her. Like, I don't, whatever right. relationship my children want to have as adults. Right. Now, one last um, question before I turn the mic over to you to promote. Back to what I was talking about. I'm, I'm always intrigued by cover selection. And like I was talking about the double message in the title missing. I also notice on the cover the picture. Now there's a there's there's a bunch of little girls in there that's kind of blurry, it's kind of faded out. And then there's a spot in there where a person is not. And I'm assuming that would have been another little girl in there, but at the same time there's a red circle and that that's a male face, correct? No, it's me. That, that is me. That is you that is- in the square? Yeah, that's um, actually that picture is was taken probably four or five months prior to my running away, and um, it was my boarding school picture. Okay. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so that's that's you there in the red circle. That's me in the red circle. Okay. See, that's what I mean. It's interesting how, in terms of covers, how what messages it sends. So wow, that now that that took me on a whole different thought pattern there then in terms of so you're there but you're not really there 
Yeah, well, I mean, that, that it's kind of like a missing poster, you know. Right. Uh, this child is missing kind of thing. Right. So, and, it, and, and it's ghostly at the same time. Yeah, that's you what know, I mean I by the blur. It, right. Mm-hmm. The blurriness yeah. gives it that ghostly feel. Eerie. Yes, that eerie feeling. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, well, I tell you what, we're down to the last few minutes, and what I do at this point is I turn the microphone over to the guest and allow him or her to promote in any manner they so choose in terms of websites, in terms of book signings, in terms of book releases or whatever. You can say anything with the exception of a dollar amount. You just can't give the price, but otherwise, in terms of how people can get to you or get a hold of Missing, uh, the mic is yours. Uh, the best way to get a hold of me or my book um, is through my website. So it's www.marnie, M-A-R-N-I-E, Grundman, G-R-U-N-D-M-A-N.com. Uh, you can email me through there. You can buy the book through there. You can also keep up on uh, the latest blogs that, that I write and my daughter writes. Um, we write on there. And you can follow me on Twitter. That's the best place to catch me on social media. That's where I'm most active. And it's just at Marnie Grunman. And that's pretty much it. Those are, you know, my two number one places to find me. All right. And that's Marnie. That's M-A-R-N-I-E Grundman, G-R-U-N-D-M-A-N. Now, I will tell you this. I think out of, of and so it depends. Some some guests I get like really high Twitter feeds and and things on. Some I get absolutely none. We put their name out there, either they don't retweet it or either. But when I put your name out there, I started getting a lot of different retweets and followers. So folks definitely are following you. <laughs> because yeah, when, I work hard. <laughs> yeah, when you, when you said you were going to be on here on a, a December tenth, I started seeing all these folks started retweeting you. I was like, all right, great. So I truly hope they all listen. But if by chance they did not, I will be archiving it on my YouTube channel. So whenever I get a chance to finish with the uh, editing on the recording and and do everything that needs to be done to move it from one format to another, it will ultimately end up on my YouTube channel where folks who didn't listen this morning can hear it and I will email that to you. You can do whatever you'd like with it in terms of posting it or sending it out or putting on your Twitter site or what have you. But this has been a fascinating story. I mean, I was riveted. I I literally, I'm sitting here like hanging on your every word. Like, what is that experience? What, my God, what could that experience be like to be a kid out there all alone in the world? Thank you very much. I appreciate the the time to be on. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again for rising early. I don't know if if, if you're not an early morning person like I'm not. I mean, I generally, when I go home after the studio, I go back to bed. I go back and take a nap. So I don't know. Oh, I'm going. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I tell you what, enjoy your time. Enjoy your day. Enjoy the holiday season, whichever holidays are. Because are you, you're still in Canada. So now, wait a minute, let me see. Did, Christmas is celebrated there too, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I know there's like Boxer Day and there's there's different days. Depending on where you are in yeah. the world, they have different days. So, um, well, yeah. if that's the case, then have a wonderful holiday. And I wish you nothing but the best with Missing. And I want to read it myself because if I was riveted to listening to you, I'm Thank sure you. I'm going to be riveted to reading about it. <laughs> I look forward to your review. Okay, great. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, take care now. You too. All right.